All right. Last night we talked about fire, right? That you can't hide fire. That once it's started, people are going to find out. And in the early church, everything was changing. Things that they thought were givens were transforming. And they were trying to figure out how, what does it mean to follow God in this transforming culture where, where everything is different than what we expected. And they needed an anchor, something to keep them in place. And that anchor was the presence of God himself, the Holy Spirit. And they saw that in, in wind and in fire when the Holy Spirit appeared. Uh, they were grounded in him. So last night we talked about fire. And this morning we're going to eventually, we're going we're gonna to talk about water. So how many of you have been to the desert like the real desert? Just like in the cartoons with the cactus and everything. Okay, a decent amount. Um, my wife loves, loves to take pictures, photographs. And we went one year for our anniversary to Joshua Tree which is a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, but she likes to take pictures right at sunrise. So she'd wake me up every morning and be like, it's time to drive into Joshua Tree. You know, it's an hour and a half to where I want to take pictures. And I'd be like, no, why? Why do we do this? And then we would drive. And I just learned a lot of things. I mean, it was beautiful, beautiful as the sun came up in the desert. But they have all these things, the, the, the cactus, cacti, I guess, in Joshua Tree are these, they have these tiny, tiny, it just looks like hairs, the spines on there. And they tell you, don't touch them. Don't touch them. And I was like, come on. And then I did, and I was like, oh, you don't touch them because all the blood gets out. Like, it just, it, it, I didn't even feel it. It was like, just, yeah, anyway, that was bad. Um, and it was an hour and a half back to the hotel. So anyway, uh, the desert, there's nobody there. Nobody, not at that time. There's her taking pictures and me like wrapping my finger. That's all there was. Uh, it was pretty amazing. How many of you like, so when you're saying God spoke to me, how many of you would say there's a time in your life where you would say definitively for sure, God said something to me, like said a sentence and I have no question that that was him speaking. Anybody? A few, okay. How many of you are like, I kind of thought maybe it was him? How many of you are like, I have no idea, but I did what I wanted, and I said, the Lord led me to do that? <laughs> oh, everyone. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't alone. Um, so what, what does it take to really go, oh, God is speaking to me? Like, w would your TV have to catch on fire and a voice come out of it, but the TV's not consumed by the fire? Like, would that do it? I, th I think for me, that might work. Um, or uh, an angel, an angel appearing, that'd be pretty good. And that's what, so just imagine, imagine you're in your hotel room and an angel appears to you and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out in the desert and await further instructions. <laughs> I don't know about you, I'd be like, well, you're here right now. <laughs> Seems like a waste to go to the desert. Then you got to come to the desert and give me further instructions. Like, why don't you just tell me right now? No, no, no. Go to the desert and do what I'll tell you when you get there. Fine. I mean, if God's going to be that straightforward. So you go to the desert. And I don't know how far it's far to the desert from here, I'm guessing. Yeah? <laughs> well, so let's just imagine you drive to the desert. I don't know how long that might take you. And you get to the desert, and you're just on this abandoned highway. There's nobody. It's just you and the road. And you're just standing there, awaiting instructions, right? And then you see this caravan coming through. It's, it's like a limousine and a bunch of cops riding motorcycles around it. And it, it's coming. You can see it in the distance because you can see forever in the, de in the desert. It's coming your way. And uh, as it gets closer, you can see the police with their pistols, you know, strapped on their thighs and in the mirrored glasses and the helmets. And, and then the Holy Spirit speaks to you. He doesn't send an angel again. You just get this impression. You just hear these words. The Holy Spirit says, hey, run up alongside that limousine. You're like, what? Is there ice cream in the limousine? 
right? Run up alongside the limousine, and you're like, oh, okay, okay. So you start to run. You're running up alongside these cops who are driving, and, and you're running alongside the limousine, and the cops are starting, what are you doing? You don't run, and you can see on the limo, there's little flags for another country. You're not even sure what country. Um, and the officer tells you, hey, move along. But you look in the window, and you can see in the back of the limo, the window's partway down, and you can see someone in there with their iPad out, and you just can barely see that what they're looking at, they, they are looking at the scripture. They're looking at the Bible on their iPad. And you shout over like, hey, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy's like, hey, oh, stop. And the caravan stops. The person says, come here. And so the cops like shake you down and you walk over there. And the person says, how could I understand if somebody doesn't explain this to me? So you get into the limousine, and this person, you've never met someone like this. This person's tall, uh, black, effeminate, this really tight suit, and you can smell like perfume. And when you shake his hand, it's soft, uh, long fingers. And he says, uh, how can I understand this? if someone doesn't explain it to me. And then you take the iPad and just starting where he is, the very verses he's reading, you say, let me explain to you the good news about a man named Jesus. And you start to walk through it with him. Well, this is, this is basically what happens in Acts chapter 8. So let's take a look at that real quick here. Okay, please don't be offended, but this is a page of my Bible. I'm just gonna set it right here. <laughs> it's, I like it because I, it fits in my fanny pack really easily. I, so I just keep it right there. Okay, Acts chapter eight, starting verse 26, it says, an angel of the Lord came to a man same, named Philip and said, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip did what he was told. He started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So we're gonna come back to what it means that he's Ethiopian and what it means that he's a eunuch, but the fact that he worked for Candace, Candace is not a person's name. It actually was the title of a series of queens in, in Ethiopia, the, the Kandaki, they were called, the, the Candaces, uh, and he works for one of them, which means he's a slave. He's a slave. Uh, so, and he'd gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, the man was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, so from the Old Testament. And the spirit said to Philip, go over toward the chariot and stay near it. So he ran up alongside. Philip ran to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip, come on, get up in the chariot. Please stop running alongside. And the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? He had no children. Because his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is Isaiah talking about? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. And then they traveled along the road and they came to some water and we're gonna talk about this, some water and why that matters. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? And he gave orders for the chariot to stop. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch didn't see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And then Philip appeared again somewhere else. And by the way, I should mention uh, verse 
37, which may be a footnote in some of your Bibles. So uh, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe in all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So that's important. We're going to come back to that too. Uh, So first, let me say this. Ethiopian, obviously, obviously for someone from Israel, an Ethiopian is what? A foreigner. He's not, he's not Jewish. He's from Africa. He's an outsider. And as a eunuch, a eunuch means he's been a slave. He's probably the child of slaves. He grew up as a slave. It's all he's known. And the reason he's a eunuch is because when he was probably 10 years old, someone decided he was going to serve the queen directly. And so he would be completely castrated, emasculated completely as a 10-year-old. And the reason they did this is the idea was that someone who's been castrated will never have children, and they'll never be married, and they don't have family ties in the same way that others do. And therefore, they're going to be loyal to the queen and do what she says and be obedient. And so they can be in charge of the, you know, they're well treated in the sense that they're, they're given plenty of money and a nice place to live, and they have no reason to ever turn against the monarch, which, which at this time in Ethiopia was always queens. It was, it was a matriarchy. It was handed down queen to queen. Um, so this is why, yeah, when he was 10, so this has been his life. He's been a eunuch uh, since he was 10. And part of that means some of the physical effects of that, right, is that he doesn't create testosterone, and so he, he uh, his, actually testosterone is what causes your long bones to stop growing, so your thigh bones, your arm bones. Uh, so he was probably very tall, taller than average for the time. Uh, you never experience male pattern balding without testosterone, so he had a nice head of hair, so that's, you know, there are some benefits. Um, clearly unable to have children. He would have been effeminate, for sure, without any testosterone. There would be no question that he'd be effeminate. Uh, And, obviously, yeah, unable to have children. And he couldn't be circumcised, which this is part of the Jewish religion. If you want to really follow God, if you really want to be one of his people, you have to be, as a man, circumcised. You cannot be a fully functioning part of the community of God, unless you're circumcised. So he's not able to be circumcised. And they have scripture to back this up. Deuteronomy 23, 1 says, no one who's been emasculated by cutting or crushing may enter the assembly of the Lord. They're not allowed. They're not good enough. Physical perfection mattered, okay? So you you cannot enter. And Josephus, who's an ancient historian, He tells us different things about what the Jews said about those who were emasculated, people like the eunuch. They said this, you are not to speak to them. They are like ones who murder children because they've removed any possibility of children. And they would actually say that a eunuch has become a eunuch because they had an effeminate spirit and their body has been changed to match the spirit within them. So basically they said, a eunuch is effeminate and can never be spoken to. They're not man enough. They'll never have children, which was a huge part, continues to be a huge part of Jewish culture. So no, they can't enter fully into the community of God. That's not possible, not with who they are. That can't be done. But... Yeah, in, in fact, to the point that you treat him like a child murderer. You don't speak to him. Why would you speak to someone like that? B- but this guy, this eunuch, had gone to Jerusalem from Africa in a chariot specifically because he wanted to worship God at the temple. That's what he wanted to do. He was what they would have called a God-fearer, someone who is trying to follow God, but he's not allowed to completely enter in because he hasn't converted to Judaism. He's not able to because he can't be circumcised. So even in the temple, there were certain places he could go and other places he couldn't. He could go as far as what they called the court of the Gentiles, which was a part of the temple that if you weren't a Jew, 
uh, but you were a God-fearer, you were trying to follow God, you were allowed to come there, but no further. That was your place. And they had another court actually called the Court of the Women, uh, where the women could come and no further. So at the very best, he, he could go where the foreigners could go. No matter what he wanted to do, no matter if he wanted to fully convert, that's as far as he could go. He's not good enough. He's disqualified because he's a foreigner, because he's been castrated, because he's effeminate, because he's unable to have children. Now, he probably was wealthy also. The fact that he has his own scroll uh, argues for that because he paid someone to copy the book of Isaiah at least. Uh, so, and that was expensive. People just didn't have their own like Bibles sitting around. So he's wealthy, but he's still an outsider. So when Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I understand this if no one will explain it to me? He probably literally means that while he was in Jerusalem trying to worship God and he bought his own Bible, which was expensive, and he said to someone, what does this mean in Isaiah? Who is Isaiah talking about, himself or someone else, that people literally would turn their backs and walk away and not speak to him? They weren't allowed to. He was a child murderer. He was a eunuch. He was effeminate. He couldn't, he couldn't be part of the family of God. So when he says... He's not just saying, like, gosh, I, this is hard to understand. He's saying, no one will explain it to me. I'm not allowed to have those conversations, so I guess I'll just keep trying to find God on my own. I guess. Because I'm, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. Because the people of God refuse to speak to him. And is this... <laughs> This happens today, all the time. Last week, I heard someone say, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, my brother, you know, a variety of things, my brother is gay. And someone said, what do you do? How, how do you have conversations with him? He said, you know, I'm a devout Christian. I just haven't spoken to him for the last 10 years because I don't want to encourage him. That's not, that's not any different than what's happening here. That guy's brother was saying, he's not... He can't enter in. He can't be a part of things. I can't talk to him. So who, who today, are there people you can think of who you would say, I'm not going to speak to them. There's not a chance. They can't enter in. They won't enter in. Why would I waste my time in a conversation? Are there people you would look the other way if they came to you and said, hey, tell me about your Jesus thing? You'd be like, oh, no. no, not you. That you'd refuse to speak to them, that you'd tell them to move along. You know, is there a certain kind of sin in your life that you're like, that's, that's not in your life, but a sin that you would look at in others' lives and say, no, it's too much. It's not for you. Are there people who frighten us? that we say, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think we should interact with them. Basically, what I'm asking you is, can you think of someone who might feel, they might feel that the community of faith, that the followers of Jesus are not interested in talking to them? That even if they had a question, they're not going to go to church because what's going to happen at church? They're going to be ignored. They're going to be rejected. Who's like that? Who can you think of like that? Oh, I know, I know the first instinct is to say, like, oh, no, no, not my church. We're open. We're... No, I, I, I have so many friends, atheists, Buddhists, uh, Baha'i, who would say, like, yeah, the Christians, they don't, they're not interested. They've got their truth. They're not interested in telling us about it. So a couple things I just want you to notice about Philip. This is really interesting. Like, if we're talking about sharing the good news, kind of this fire that has caught us through the Holy Spirit that spreads. Here's, here's five things to notice about Philip and how he interacts. It's really interesting. Number one, he's led by the Holy Spirit. Okay, it starts with an angel. That's nice when you get it, when the angel's like, hey, go down to the McDonald's right there outside the hotel and await instructions. You're like, uh, uh, I mean, you want me to buy fries? Like, what kind of instructions? Um, that would be great if it started that way. But Philip responds to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, hey, run up alongside the chariot, right? And he's like, yeah, okay, good. 
he's not like me where he's like constantly asking questions. It doesn't appear. He just is like, okay. Uh, so the Holy Spirit leads him. That's the first thing. The Holy Spirit opens his eyes and says, go do this th thing. Second, he goes where the eunuch is. He goes to where the eunuch is. Now, the Holy Spirit told him to go there, but he's not like, he doesn't run up alongside the eunuch and say, hey, man, you want to come to my weekly meeting and then I'll tell you something? Hey, man, we're doing this great conference in D.C. You want to come? Hey, man, Sunday, 9 a.m., my church. Hey, you should come there, and this other guy will tell you some stuff. No, he goes to where the eunuch is. He goes outside of his community of faith to find him. So that's interesting. And then get this, God is already working in the life of the eunuch. We think, we think a lot of times like, oh, God's, we got to go find these people who are so messed up and broken, and I'm going to be the first time they've ever heard about Jesus, and we're going to start from there. And some of you who've been to Big Break have heard this story from me before, but this is the one I always think about. One of the first times I ever went out on campus to share Christ with someone, um, my friend Brian took me out and said, we're going to do random evangelism. You're just going to walk up to a stranger and say, can we talk about Jesus? I was like, oh, man, that's crazy. Okay, let's do it. And we went out, and I ha we all do this. We, if you're ever doing random evangelism, you start doing this crazy calculus. You're, like, looking at people, trying to figure out who's lonely and will talk to me no matter what I say, right? <laughs> and you usually you find the one guy sitting alone in the corner of the student hangout place who's studying, like, physics, and you're like, that guy. There's no way he's enjoying himself right now. And, and that's the guy I picked. And I went up to him, and I was like, hey, would this is like my crazy evangelistic technique. Hey. Like awkward hey, really long. Hey. And he like looks up, and I said, would you want to talk about spiritual stuff? <laughs> and he was like, howdy, stranger. No, he, uh, he closed his physics book, and he said, sit down. He's like, yeah, I want to talk about this. I was like, great. And sit down, and he goes, I'm the most Buddhist person I know. And I was like, oh, dang it. <laughs> dang it. I chose poorly. Like, this guy, there's no way. There's no way. He doesn't want to have this conversation. He goes, yeah, I'm the most Buddhist person I know. In fact, my family who's Buddhist, they're always like, why are you so Buddhist, man? And I was like, oh, no. He's like super Buddhist. And I was like, OK. All right, tell me about that. Why are you so Buddhist? And he starts telling me all these beautiful things about the Buddha, his teachings, how his life has been impacted. And uh, then he goes, I mean, he talks for like 10 minutes. And he goes, there's just, there's one thing I don't get. Like the Buddha says, don't worship me, I'm not God. But that's, I mean, honestly, that's kind of what we do in Buddhism. And I just wish there was a guy who came along and said, I am God, you should worship me. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Well, I can tell you about that guy. And he was like, what? And then uh, I started showing him. We started walking through some things Jesus said about himself in the book of John and asking him questions, you know, Jesus saying he's the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father but through him and these sorts of things. I get to the end. I said, what do you think? And he was like, oh, well, I guess I'm a Christian now. <laughs> like, so he went from devout Buddhist to follower of Jesus in a 15-minute conversation. Why? Why? Because, because God was already at work in his life. God was teaching him about himself through the teachings of the Buddha, which is incredible. It's amazing. Uh, but that's what's happening here. The eunuch is already interested. He's already trying to follow in his way, right? He's trying to figure out, how can someone like me follow God? So Philip's led by the Holy Spirit. He goes where the eunuch is. God's already at, at work in the life of the eunuch. And, and Philip starts talking about the good news where? Right where the eunuch has questions. Right, right where it's already opened up. He says, yes, let's start with that question and go from there, which is really interesting. I think a lot of times we come in with this predetermined idea of like, this is what it means to tell someone about Jesus. And I start with this, God loves you, you're evil. God desires you to be in relationship with him, even though you're evil. You know, like, right, we have this place we start. Instead of starting where their questions are, like, 
Is it okay for me to be gay and be a Christian? That's a really good, important, necessary question for someone who's gay to answer, I think. Why wouldn't we start there if that's what they're asking? How about someone who says, uh, did I kill my baby when I had an abortion? Why do I want to start with God loves you and you're evil? Why wouldn't I start with her question? Seems like it's an important one, a really important one that means a lot to her in her life. And that's what Philip does. He starts with the question, why did God allow this horrible thing to happen to me in my past? Oh, wait, let me, let me show you. Let me, uh, actually, let's start with, let me show you this short video, uh, and then we'll discuss that. No, why, why would you not start with that question? Why wouldn't you start with the place that they're wondering and asking, could you please explain this to me? Why will no one explain this to me? Why don't we start there? That's what Philip did. That's interesting. And then he doesn't hesitate to let him know that the only thing that prevents him from entrance into the kingdom is that he believe, is that the only thing that prevents him is that he believe. So here's another interesting thing. I just want to walk us through a little bit the good news that Philip shares. So he starts with this verse, right, that the eunuch is reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So clearly, I mean, as followers of Jesus, we would say, we know that what Philip said was, oh no, this isn't about Isaiah. This is about Jesus. He was the sheep led to slaughter who didn't open his mouth, that died so that we could be made clean so that we could be made whole, so we didn't have to be broken anymore, that we could be healed. He is that sheep. And it was unjust. He didn't deserve that. He did it for us, right? He starts with that. But what's really interesting to me, if you go back to Isaiah and ask yourself the question, what is good news to this eunuch? I don't think Philip started, stopped there. It says, starting there, he explained to him the good news about Jesus. So the question, we get so hung up on the message, which is important, essential, necessary. We have to have the right message. But sometimes we forget about the person we're sharing the message with. And sometimes we just have to ask ourselves just that question. What is good news for this person? Not just the good news that Jesus loves us, and then he came to earth and died for our sins. That, that's great news for everyone. But what's good news for this individual? What was good news for this Buddhist guy? He was like, I wish someone would just come along and tell me that he's God and that I could follow him. Great, I've got good news for you. What was good news for this eunuch? Well, it's not just what's in Isaiah uh, 54. It starts with that, right? Or 53. But then he goes on from there, I'm guessing to this, this is really interesting. This is Isaiah 54, one through five. He says, by the way, I should just mention this. The, the reason I would say this is likely is not just because of the content, but the way that scripture was written at that time, it was just on a scroll, okay? So they just kept reading. It wasn't broken up by chapters, there weren't verses. So he would just start there and say, yeah, here's the sheep that was killed, and then we go on from here, and then this happens, and this happens. And in starting in chapter 54, it says this, sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child. And remember, this is a guy who cannot have children. He's not able to. That was taken from him so that he would be loyal to the empire, to the queen. Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. So if you can't have kids, party. Be happy. Have a celebration. And, and then verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide. Basically, start putting additions on your house. Make it larger. For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. You're going to have so many kids. They're going to take over the world. Don't be afraid. You're not going to be ashamed. Don't fear disgrace. You're not going to be humiliated. 
You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. So in Jewish culture, if you couldn't have children for whatever reason, you were considered an outcast. It goes on from there. Because your maker will be your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He's called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back with everlasting kindness, compassion, unfailing love. So is this good news for the eunuch? You can't have any children. Don't despair. God still loves you and is going to be in deep relationship with you. And in some ways, you're better off than those who can have children because you're going to have people. They're not born from you, but they will be your children. And it goes on from there, which is, which is fascinating. I think that would be good news. And then in, verse, in chapter 55, it goes on. Here's this guy that has left his home for months to travel through the desert to come to try and worship God, and he's been rejected there. And then in, in chapter 55, he says, look at this. Come all who are thirsty. You're wanting something. You're wanting the water. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. And goes on from there that you can be be satisfied with the Lord. If you're seeking him, you will find him. You can find him. Come. Why wouldn't you? So here's this guy who's been rejected, who can't have children, who's a eunuch, who's been told you can never be part of the family of God. And he says, hey. Hey, I know everyone's saying that you can't have children and that means you're not qualified to be part of the family of God, but that's not what it says here. The good news is that Jesus, this one who was sacrificed for us, that he says, rejoice for God will be your spouse. He says, you're thirsty, you're hungry to be near God. Good, come. It's not even gonna cost you anything, come. And then, and then, and this is fascinating, chapter 56 God is talking about the salvation that will come for those who are not Jewish. And it starts uh, starts in verse 3, 56.3. This is so, how could this not be good news for the eunuch? Listen to this. Let no foreigner, like an Ethiopian, who's bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. I'm not not qualified. I'm an outsider. I'm not going to be part of his people. And don't let any eunuch complain and say, I'm only a dry tree. I'll never have fruit. I won't have kids. Because this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs, those disqualified people, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my agreements with them, my covenant, to them... I'll give them this, within my temple, within my temple, not just in the court of the Gentiles, not in the court of women, not as an outsider, within my temple and its walls, I will give them a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. They're not just going to be adopted like all those other people that think they're the insiders. They're not just going to be adopted. They're getting something even better than that. I'll give them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, who say, I will serve him, who love the name of the Lord, who worship him, who keep the Sabbath, who hold fast to my covenant, those people, I'll bring them to my holy mountain and I will give them joy in my house of prayer. Oh, man. I'm pretty sure the eunuch would have heard this and said, what? What? No one said this to me when I was in Jerusalem? This is like, it's this much further on the scroll. Why did someone not say this? I'm going to get something better. I'm going to be allowed in the temple. I'm going to be allowed on the holy mountain. And God's going to give me joy? What? How is that not good news? That's amazing. That's incredible. But the eunuch says, 
you know, Philip's telling him this whole story. This is the story of Jesus, God in the flesh, killed by human beings as a sacrifice to take away all the brokenness of the world. And he tells him about baptism, right? Which he probably was familiar with this already. But baptism was a way that you said all the dirty things in my life, you enter into the water. Baptism, you, you just go under the water and it's like you die. Every bad thing you've ever done, it's not... It's not yours anymore. You come out clean. It was, it was a ritual of washing. You go into the water and then you come out clean. So he's telling him about all these things. And the eunuch says to him, look, there's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he probably literally means what prevents me. What thing about me disqualifies me from getting, you've been telling me all these amazing things. So what prevents me, which of my defects will not allow me to enter into the new life and the community of these Jesus followers you're talking about? My nationality, is that it? Is it because I'm African? Is it because I'm black? Is that what keeps me from entering in? Is that the defect in your eyes that prevents me from entering in, from being baptized? Is it the fact that I'm castrated, that I'm effeminate, that I'll never marry, that I won't have children? And Philip says, what? Ah, That's none of those things. There's nothing that prevents you from entering the water except do you believe? That's it. All that other stuff doesn't matter. Do you believe? Sometimes we have these things in our lives that we say, oh, that prevents me from coming to Jesus. For those who aren't followers of Jesus to say, I can't even start. For those who are to say, I can't be near him. And it could be any number of things. It could be stuff from our past. And yeah, I've had friends and family where it's things like abortions. You go like, that disqualifies me. I can't come to Jesus. I can't be near him. It could be something like abuse. Either you've been abused or you've abused others. Orientation, I think is one that I hear often. Sexual orientation. Things you've done, experimentation, Uh, a lot of times with adults, uh, uh, people who've been through life for a while, it'd be divorce, something they've done in their family, Uh, harming other people, harming yourself, eating disorders, sex outside of marriage, drugs, alcohol, whatever, that you look at something in your life and you say, this disqualifies me, clearly. I can't, I can't come to him. What prevents me? Which of my defects prevents me from entering into the new life and the community of Christ's followers? And what does Philip say to us at that moment? What prevents you from coming near? Nothing. Nothing. Not things you've done, not things you've wanted to do, not things you're planning to do, not things that have been done to you. Nothing, nothing prevents you from coming to him, from entering into the water, except do you believe? Do you believe? Baptism, it's this cleansing ritual. And the early church fathers tell us, and we know this from Jewish tradition, baptism was always done naked, which we've changed that tradition, uh, and that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. But actually, it's one of the ways, actually, it's, we know for sure that there were women deacons, and that's actually one of the reasons. Uh, women did baptisms together, and the, the women deacons would oversee that, uh, and the men would oversee the men's baptisms. But baptisms were really special. You didn't wear anything, no jewelry, no clothes, and there's one reason for that, because the water was cleansing water. It was a gift from God that would make you clean, and you wanted nothing between you and the presence of God cleansing you. And it was always done in running water. It was always in a stream. It was never in a lake. It was never in a bathtub. It was always in a river. It was always, or they had baptismals that had running water coming through them. It was uh, never, it was always in fresh water, never salty. So it wasn't in the ocean. Because this is about getting clean. And that was part of the thing. So what happens is he looks over and sees this place where the water is running and says, what can I do that? Does that, what prevents me? And Philip says, nothing, nothing prevents you. Do you want to be in the presence of God? Do you want to be forgiven? Do you want to be made whole? Nothing prevents you. Let's do it. Let's go. Do you believe? Yeah, you're about to be reborn. 
You're about to be reborn. And that, that's part of the thing. Uh, newborns come without clothing, right? And that's part of why they, they did it naked. Um, which is really interesting as you start to consider the fact that this man, this Ethiopian eunuch, for him to enter in finally into the community of God in the full way that he desired, which I imagine he was excited about, required for him to take off his clothes and everything that he thought disqualified him was revealed. Everything. His emasculation, his skin color, that he was an outsider, right? A foreigner. That's beautiful. That's amazing. The Holy Spirit saw this man who thought he couldn't enter fully into the community of faith, even though he desperately wanted to do so. And the Spirit spoke to Philip and sent him on a journey to find the man who was alone in the desert and to bring him to life, to bring him to the living water. That's beautiful. And I wonder right now, who is alone and wandering in the desert, seeking home, unsure if they can approach God in our community. I wonder who's been told by the gatekeepers, you can come no further toward God. And I wonder who the Holy Spirit has chosen for us to find and to invite into the fullness of God's community with the good news about Jesus. And that's what happens. You're out in the desert with this effeminate stranger in this limo. And he asks you, which of my defects prevents me. And you say nothing. Nothing prevents you. There's so many who give you a list, an encyclopedia of barriers between you and God, but nothing prevents you so long as you believe. And so you wade into the water and you're shocked by the coldness, right? It takes your breath away. And you call for him, come, come join me in the water. And the police officers are standing there with their arms Folded, and the limo driver has stepped outside to watch what's going to happen, holding his shiny black cap in his hand. And the man comes and stands at the water's edge. And he stares at the sunlight on the rippled surface for a long time. And then he takes off his jacket and he sets it aside. And then his tie and then his carefully pressed shirt and his undershirt. He takes off his shoes and he tucks the socks inside. He folds his slacks puts them on his shirt, and when he is naked, you can see the scars. You can see every wound, every scar, every evil thing that's been done to him and by him and for him and through him, and those scars, they shine brighter than the chrome on the cars in the desert, brighter than the reflection on the water, brighter than the sun itself, because such things can no longer keep him from the Holy One. And you call out to him, do you turn your back on the wrongs in your life, all the sin, all the evil, all the brokenness that you've been a part of, the sins that you've committed, do you turn your back on that? And he runs into the water shouting, I do, I do, I do. And he goes down into the water and he comes up whole newly born, newly alive, a son of the Most High God. And then the Spirit whisks you away, and the last thing you see is the water sparkling as it flies from his laughing face, his hands thrown up in the air as he dances from the water. Lord Jesus, we thank you We thank you that there is nothing about us that can prevent us from coming near if that's what we desire. We thank you that you tell us in this very story that there's, there's nothing that prevents us other than the fact that we believe and say, I want to be part of the story. We thank you that there's no such thing as someone that you've declared an outsider to the place that they cannot approach you. We thank you that you've said that your love is so great that we can't be separated from it, that it's not height or death, depth or angels, principalities, things in the present, things to come, that there's nothing, nothing that's ever been created that can keep us from your love. 
That's incredible. And I pray you'd open our eyes to the places where your Holy Spirit is speaking to us, that your fire has come upon us and you've said, here's an outsider, here's someone who's lost and alone. Go to them and show them the way home. Give us courage to follow you. And for those places in our life where we are the eunuch and we're saying we're disqualified, something about me doesn't allow me to come near Jesus, please remind us of the message. There is no such thing that we can approach you and that we can enter into the water and be forgiven. In your name, amen.